Welcome back to Bombastic Nation and Ting and Ting and Ting. I'm Mr. Giant and I'm back with some more vibes for you, yes I. And uh, this one is another one that was suggested by uh, Sebastian. Uh, thank you again, my brethren, for uh, suggesting this one to me. This one is called Origin of the Germanic Tribes, Barbarians Documentary. So we're going to look at this and see what's going on. Thank you guys for watching this with me once again. Man, I hope you guys are taking care of each other, all right? Uh, a co-worker of mine's uh, son just came down with the virus. Hope he feel, feels better. I know he watches some of my videos and things. Hope you feel better soon, my brother. Take care of yourself. Everybody take care of themselves, all right? Let's YouTube and SimSim and see what this is all about here. The so-called barbarians the Romans did battle with over the centuries, none have made as lasting an impact on the history <laughs> this just got me excited the there. peoples. They terrorized the empire for centuries before conquering its western half in 476 AD, arguably ending the era of antiquity and ushering in the Middle Ages. The era of antiquity. shine the spotlight on them, exploring their culture and society, while telling the history of the earliest origins of the ancient Germanic peoples, the greatest enemy of Rome. Shout out to Netflix and its new historical TV series, Barbarians, for sponsoring this video. Barbarians is a brand new TV series set in antiquity with the backdrop of the famous Battle of Teutoburg Forest, in which the legions of the Roman Empire, led by Publius Quinctilius Varus, are ambushed by the alliance of Germanic tribes led by the former Roman auxilia Arminius. This dramatization of the events of 9 AD is everything history fans were asking for for years, with awesome production quality, attention to detail, historiosity, and great actors. I'm about to check this out. The speak Latin and German only, making the show truly atmospheric. We have been clamoring for historical movies and TV shows to return to our screens. Yes. And Netflix is giving us just that. Come on. So we've been watching this great new show even without being sponsored. Streaming it is the best way to show how much we as a historical community care about seeing more historical dramas. Okay. I still love so watching those. stream it on Netflix if you're subscribed. Or subscribe to stream it if you're not. I'm going to so have to check this out. The ancient Germanic peoples. In short... They were a collection of Iron Age tribes that lived in the rugged forests west and north of the Rhine and Danube rivers during mid to late antiquity, best known for their long and complicated relationship with the Roman Empire, with whom they traded, integrated with, and most importantly, made war on. Broadly speaking, they are ancestrally related to many peoples in Europe today including the Dutch, Swiss, Austrians, Flemish, Swedes, Norwegians, Danes, and of course, the modern Germans, all of whom are speakers of modern Germanic dialects. In 98 AD, the historian Tacitus completed a book titled De Origine et Situ Germanorum, more commonly known as Germania, a Roman survey of the history and culture of their Germanic foes, this tome provides us with the most valuable window into Germanic culture, and will be referred to throughout this video. Let us begin with a quote. Undivided Germany is separated from the Gauls, Rhaetians, and Pannonians by the rivers Rhine and Danube, from the Sarmatians and Dacians by mutual fear of mountains, and the rest of it is surrounded by ocean. As for the Germans themselves, I should suppose them to be native to the area, who would have left Asia or Africa or Italy to look for Germany? With its wild scenery and harsh climate, it is pleasant neither to live in nor look upon unless it be one's home. As com so all those tribes come together. I wonder, I wonder how many people in Germany have their lineage through those tribes or know their lineage through those tribes. You know what I mean? Because after all these years, it's, it's, it has to have gotten diluted. And of course, for political reasons too, they're gonna have to, you know, sort of dilute it to let everybody become sort of one country. And that would like increase patriotism. But then again, 
they obviously had it there with their own different uh, tribal traditions and stuff and they, they had to have different tra traditions and yet still they were fighting and maintaining their sovereignty I guess you, you could call it well, that's interesting condescending as his account is Tacitus was not entirely incorrect by his time the various Germanic tribes had been living in their traditional territories for at least a they call them Germanic tribes however their okay. true origins are a little more complex than okay let's guests. hear it and the key to understanding it lies in linguistics the Germanic languages are part of the Indo-European linguistic family and therefore share a common ancestor with almost all of the languages of Europe, Northern India, and Western Asia. As of now, the leading idea is the Kurgan hypothesis, which postulates that the Proto-Indo-European language was spoken by a nomadic Europid people who inhabited the Pontic steppe from at least the 6th millennium BC. Known titularly as the Kurgan people, or alternatively the Yamnaya, they were hardy seasonal livestock herders and were probably among the first humans to domesticate the wild horse oh, wow. as food and later as transportation. Around the 4th millennium BC, these pastoralists are said to have utilized the advantage given to them by their four-legged friends to expand out of their steppe homeland and across a huge swath of the Eurasian landmass displacing or intermixing with the indigenous peoples already living there. Over many centuries, the Proto-Indo-European tongue spoken by these various branches of Yamnaya migrants gave rise to the early versions of Greek, Latin, Sanskrit, and of course, German. Proto-Germanic languages and cultures were said to have emerged as a distinct branch of Indo-European during the Bronze Age, contained to the northern coast of modern Germany, the Jutland Peninsula, and the southern tip of Sweden. In the late Iron Age, they expanded from the Rhine to the Vistula rivers, bordering the Celtic peoples to the west, and the scytho sarmatian horse lords to the east. Early Germanic society was predominantly rural. You know, talking about linguistics, I mean, look at the English language. You have different dialects of it, and it's sort of the original English is not really spoken anymore. You know what I mean? And that is because of colonization. You know, you brought, you brought all these people who had different languages. You know, like for instance, the Patois language that, that evolved in the, in the Caribbean. It's a mixture of different languages put together. Because when they brought the slaves, they weren't allowed to speak, well, not so much they weren't allowed to speak, but they were mixed in with different tribes and they all speak different languages in order for them. That way they can communicate and start a rebellion. So a new language sort of came out of that. Linguistics. It's kind of, kind of cool. So, you know, over the years and stuff, you know, good became, bad became the word for good, you know, and the man, you're bad, you know, that means you're good, you know what I mean? And other little simple things like that are getting switched around. So a hundred years from now, what is a language going to look like? Because, uh, you know, if you take somebody from that time and bring them here, yeah, and, and the German language that they speak now, are they going to understand each other? I guess basically they probably will, but think about it. You know what I mean? That's kind of interesting to think of. Unlike their proto-Indian European ancestors, they mostly lived sedentary lives in small to mid-sized villages. The economy of these villages revolved mainly around the rearing of goats, sheep and cattle, and the cultivation of grain. Ample lush wilderness meant that hunting and foraging played a significant role in their lifestyle as well. They were never a single nation, and instead a spectrum of many independent tribes with similar but differing cultures and languages. Among these were larger confederations, like the Suebi, Marcomanni, and Alemanni, and the political map of ancient Germania was ever-shifting, as independent factions splintered out of larger tribes. Larger tribes swallowed up smaller tribes, and loosely organized alliances came together and fell apart. As one can imagine, these factions were all highly martial in nature. 
Tacitus claimed that while kingship in Germania was determined by bloodline, it was the subordinate war leaders who were the real power in their tribe. In turn, the war leaders only remained in power as long as they could continue to deliver victories for their people, and were promptly ousted if they showed cowardice or incompetence. Let us now expand on what this warrior culture looks like. Unlike the chariot Let's riders do. of Gaul to their west, and the mounted archers of Sarmatia to their east, the ancient Germanic peoples possessed little to no cavalry, as horses were a symbol of luxury reserved for kings and nobles. As such, Germanic armies were made predominantly of infantry. Quality metal was a luxury, so iron panoply was reserved for tribal leaders and their inner circle. The common warrior was usually clad only in linen or leather, and naked from the waist up. They wielded javelins, lances, and short spears, called framea, which required comparatively less iron to forge. They protected themselves with long, oval or rectangular shields, in which was embedded a hard iron shield boss, which could be used to bash the enemy to deal blood force damage. However, what the Germanic peoples lacked in equipment, they made up with ferocious and fearless fighting. Tacitus remarked on their stigma of spinelessness with grim commentary. Traitors and deserters are hung from trees. Cowards and poor fighters are plunged into the mud of the marshes with a hurdle over their heads. Despite the bellicose nature of the Germanic peoples, there were avenues for non-violent diplomacy among them. The most prominent of these were the great intertribal gatherings known as hustings, or simply as the fig. According to Tacitus, these assemblies would take place only when the moon was neither new nor full. The summoned tribes would arise, and once there, they would take their seats while girded with their weapons. Kings and chiefs would speak one by one, in order of importance based on age, birthright, and battles won. As the leaders made various proposals, the crowd would groan loudly if they disapproved, and clash their spears enthusiastically if they approved. It was through gatherings like these that issues of land rights and resources... You know, it's funny that uh, things like this people would think of as uncivilized, where they clash and ungrunted. But it served a purpose. ...during these gatherings, who acted as powerful mediators between tribes, with the authority to force obedience to keep the peace. Let us use this as a segue to discuss the nature and role of religion in early Germanic society. By far the best known variant of Germanic paganism lies in the mythology of the Viking Age, which was adhered to by the Norsemen in the early medieval era, even as the rest of their Germanic cousins eventually adopted Latin Christianity. However, we should not assume that Norse paganism was the exact same as the rites practiced by their ancestral relatives of antiquity. After all, they were separated by over 700 years. With that said, anyone familiar with the Viking pantheon would certainly find some familiar faces among the gods of the Swabi, Alemanni, and Marcomanni. On the subject of Germanic faith, Tacitus had this to say. Of the gods, they worship Mercury the most, to whom on certain days they count even the sacrifice of human life northward. Hercules and Mars they appease with animal life as is permissible. The deities the Roman historian mentions are distinctly Olympian in nature, but Tacitus was actually drawing parallels between native Germanic gods and the Greco-Roman pantheon. Mercury, in this case, was Wadanaz, an early form of Odin, thus associated as both he and Mercury were messengers for the gods and guides between the mortal world and the afterlife. Hercules was probably Donna, who like the ancient Greek hero was a great warrior, adventurer and beast slayer. His mighty hammer was associated with Hercules' club. As one might have guessed, Donna was an early form of Thor. Meanwhile, Mars oh, wow. was related to Tyr a minor deity by the time of the Viking Age, but a highly important patron of war and wisdom during antiquity. Although Tacitus compared him to the Roman god of war, 
he was most likely derived from the Proto-Indo-European Deus, the same god from which the Greek Zeus and Roman Jupiter evolved from. So while it is easy to dismiss Tacitus's rebranding of the Germanic gods into Roman ones, they were actually more interconnected than most realize. Not referenced by Tacitus, but found in the archaeological records, are other aspects of Germanic mythology, including the proto-versions of the goddess of love, beauty and fertility, Freya, and Yggdrasil, the world tree. We know very little about how the German peoples carried out their religious rites, but according to Tacitus, human sacrifice appears to have been practiced. Ancient bodies found in the bogs of northern Germany show evidence of ritual slaughter. Tacitus also claimed that Germanic priests read divinations based on the flight patterns of birds, the casting of runes written on tree bark, and the behavior of sacred white horses never soiled by mortal use. Meanwhile, two golden horns found in southern Denmark feature engravings of dancing warriors adorned in horned helmets. This likely depicts some form of a seasonal cycle, where ceremonies were held according to the transition between spring, summer, autumn and winter. It is here that we will delve into the Germanic people's interactions with the Roman world, a multi-layered, centuries-long relationship that would, in time, come to define the fate of both cultures. For centuries, it was the Celtic peoples that stood as a buffer between Germania and Rome, but by the late 2nd century BC, the long struggle between the Gallic tribes and the growing Republic had begun to turn in the latter's favour. By 118 BC, the Romans had managed to subdue a portion of southern Gaul into the province of Gallia Narbonensis and made the Celtic Federation of Noricum into their client state. As the Latins crept north, so too did the Germans begin marching south. Around 120 BC, either crippling floods or freezing in the southern Jutland Peninsula compelled the Cimbri and Teutonese tribes to begin a mass migration, sending 200,000 warriors along with their families. The war is on! Them. Thus, the Roman and Germanic worlds met for the first time, and this was almost immediately defined by bloodshed. We have covered the Cimbrian War in a previous video, so we won't go into detail here. In summary, the Romans were able to win a Pyrrhic victory at the cost of tens of thousands of lives and received a wake-up call to the true ferocity of their new foe. The next major clash between these two civilizations began sometime in the 60s BC, when one King Ariovistus of the Suebi crossed into Eastern Gaul with an army of 15,000 warriors. Originally there to help the Celtic Sequani tribe fight their Edui rivals, the Swabian leader became enamoured with the fertile lands he had arrived in, turning on his Gallic allies and seizing their realm for himself. Meanwhile, Roman Betrayal. governor Julius Caesar was at the height of his ambition. Hot off the tales of subduing the migrating Helvetii tribe, he turned his attention to Ariovistus, while the Germanic king was originally labelled a friend of Rome, both he and Caesar lusted for the spoils of war, and in 58 BC they clashed at the Battle of Voskis in a struggle for dominance over eastern Gaul. Caesar won a decisive victory and continued the conquest of Gaul, culminating at the siege of Alessia in 52 BC. With this, the Roman border was moved right up to the Rhine River, all of a sudden, the tribes of Germania looked westward and saw not squabbling Gallic tribes, but the strongest army in the ancient world, professional and unyielding. The death of the Republic and birth of the Principate coincided with a new era in Roman-Germanic relations. When the first emperor, Augustus, came to power, he extended Rome's territory up to the Danube River. Thus a direct frontier between Rome and Germania was established along the key rivers of the Rhine and Danube, a frontier that would remain more or less deadlocked for centuries. In the following years, back and forth struggle continued. In 16 BC, the emperor's stepsons Tiberius and Drusus launched an invasion into the Alps east of the Rhine, subduing many tribes. 
the Germanic peoples never gave up an inch of land without a fight, and that same year, the Tencteri, Usipetes, and Sugambri inflicted a crushing defeat upon the 5th Legion, Gallia, on the banks of the Lower Rhine. Tiberius pushed back, and according to Roman sources, had managed to subdue the whole of Germania into an obedient province by 6 BC. This would last a grand total of 15 years, before the Cherusci Prince Arminius pulled off a devastating ambush on three Roman legions, led by Publius Quinctilius Varus at Teutoburg Forest in 9 AD. So absolutely crushing was this defeat, that many historians consider it the worst military disaster in Roman history. Following this, Rome retreated from Germania and gave up on ever trying to directly rule the region. The oh, reason wow. Arminius was able to defeat the empire was in part due to his background. Born as the son of a Germanic chieftain, he had been sent to Rome as a hostage and served in the imperial military, learning all there was to know about Roman tactics and military doctrine. See, that, 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 that's crazy. While Arminius would eventually Why would they teach the hostages their military secrets? He was one of many Germanic peoples who had spent their life cooperating with the empire. His life was a testament to the fact that as much as the Romano-Germanic story was defined by war, so too was it defined by diplomacy, trade, and cultural integration. The principal means by which Rome maintained diplomacy with their warlike neighbors was a policy of divide and control. As we covered earlier, the Germanic peoples were locked in inter-tribal struggles, and as a result, the Romans were often able to use hostages, bribes, and alliances with specific tribes to keep the spears of Germania pointed at each other rather than at Rome. Many Germanic peoples soon realized that doing business with Rome was far more profitable than making war on them. Between the 1st and 3rd centuries AD, trade between the two cultures boomed, concentrated at border forts along the Rhine and Danube frontier. Thousands upon thousands of Roman artifacts have been found across Germany, Denmark, Sweden, and Eastern Europe, including Campanian pottery, bronze And of course, there probably was that mixing of, uh, of people, too. Inter Inter-tribal marriages, internationality marriages. First, but their most valuable products lay in amber and slaves, usually captives from rival tribes. For decades, relative stability prevailed along the Rhine and Danube frontiers, and although both Rome and the Germanic peoples would occasionally challenge one another, no major wars were fought between them. This changed in 166 AD, when a massive confederation of tribes, led by the Marcomanni, attempted a mass southward migration into the Roman Empire. Naturally, Emperor Marcus Aurelius could not allow this, and as a result, spent 14 years fighting in the brutal slugfest that was the Marcomannic Wars. Once more, Rome prevailed, but you there see, was something it, they had not considered. That's what I say, man, you know what I mean? 14 years later, somebody else was like, let's take it, you know, let's go get it. You know, and they probably use a lot of stuff saying, you know, hey, look what they did to us back then, you know, and they use that on people's heads, you know. Look what happened to us 14 years ago. Let's go back, let's, re let's get it, you know, let's get our revenge or, or whatever, those people. So, you know, that's the thing about invading somebody. Maybe 14 years later, maybe 20 years later. They're gonna get. They're gonna come. Somebody's gonna use that and come back. I mean, it's happening as we speak. You know what I mean? The 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 the, the civil war was years ago, and now there's people using that, saying the good old days. Let's keep it that way. You know, let's let's come back. You know, that that's the thing about it. It's just repeating, repeating, repeating. What could have prompted such a massive confederation of people to uproot themselves to leave their homeland in the first place? Today. Most historians agree that they were being pushed out, assailed from the east by a mysterious foe they feared more than they feared Rome. Indeed, as the second century transitioned into the third, new confederations were forming in the heartland of Germania, stronger, larger and fiercer than any who had come before them. 
Pompeii would set in motion the next chapter in the struggle between the Roman and Germanic worlds, bringing the empire to its knees and reshaping the entire history of Europe in the process. Join us next time as we continue our history of the ancient Germanic peoples by covering the rise of the great conquerors, the Goths and the Franks. Make sure you are subscribed to our channel and have pressed the bell button. Please consider liking, commenting and sharing. It helps immensely. Our videos would be impossible. All right, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna watch the. This was really well done. Whoo! I enjoyed this. I thoroughly enjoyed this. Learned a lot from it. You know what I mean? This was really enjoyable. I keep saying that, don't I? But anyway, man, I'll leave a link in the description for this one. You all have to check out Kings and Queens. They have some good stuff. What is it called? What is the name of this? Kings and something. Well, you know, it was in there. <laughs> I got all that information floating, uh, floating around in my head and thing. You know, it's floating with me. Those that information, but uh, it's it's crazy how uh, we, we keep repeating the same thing over and over, and we think we're doing something different. Over and over, it's the same thing. We bring up, you know old things and use the old things to create problems for the, the modern world you know here's something i was thinking of when i was watching this here's something now we think that we are more civilized than they were but i don't think we are more civilized than they were we still do atrocities and wars we just hide it better now with the information age as it is now with the internet is coming out to, you know that a lot worse things have been done than we think you know they're not it cannot be hidden from us as much anymore uh the way they communicated like they talk about the grunts and the banging of uh, of the shields and stuff these days that would that would seem kind of barbaric but it served a purpose then you understand it served a purpose for the time you know what i mean and uh so what makes us smarter than them because we have cars and stuff like that you know what i mean and, and here's another thing Back then when they conquered people, they conquered them. Now they do take some of their traditions and their medicines and stuff that they use. But let's say a smaller tribe probably had the cure for cancer. But because they conquered them and then suppressed them, you know, that's just an, that's just a, an example. It could have happened. We don't know. Because we destroyed them. Instead of learning from them for the betterment of, uh, you know, of the whole of humanity. But that's going to be hard to do because everything is about the dollar anymore, you know. If they find a cure for something, no, no we won't get that. And then there's going to be generic brands and boom. You know what I'm saying? But anyway, I ain't going to babble on too much. I'm going to leave links uh, up here so you can keep watching these videos. Just keep watching these videos, man. Because, you know, I'm not always babble through some of them, you know what I mean. Give a little bit of insight. Give a little bit of my own thinking of things, you understand what I mean? I hate to use the word opinions. So I'm just watching and saying stuff. But anyway, man, y'all take care of each other. Cool right